Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Data Race Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Uh, welcome to another uh, Vaccination Data Seminar Talk. We're excited today to have Pavel Kunov. Um, he is the, the Vice President of Research and Design at Stardog, a graph database um, that's been around for a while. So he's here to talk about query optimization, which is something I care a lot about. Um, so Pavel is in Germany, so we appreciate him staying up late with us uh, to, to talk about databases. Um, as always, as Pavel has given the talk, if you have any questions for him, please unmute your mic, say who you are, and fire away. And feel free to do this at any time, because otherwise he's talking to a blank screen and it's boring and not, not as fun. So, Pavel, thank you so much for being here. The floor is yours. Go for it. Okay, thanks a lot for having me. Um, so, we will talk about Stardog um, database system, particularly the query optimizer, particularly the join order and the cardinality estimation stuff. Um, so just a um, quick overview of what's going to happen next. I will present the general overview of the Stardog. And um, then I will have to talk at least a little bit about the data model and the query language. So this is something like if I was talking about a SQL system, I would completely skip that part and just go straight into the internals of the system. But since this is a bit of an un unorthodox um, setup for many of you, I will have to at least explain how the data, the data is modeled and how the query language looks like. So you understand what we are dealing with. And then we go into the details of the Stardog query optimizer, how it makes queries efficient. Uh, a lot of which is going to be about the join order um, and trying to select the best way to uh, join graph patterns. And that depends heavily on statistics. So Stardog is a cost-based optimizer and um, the cost model is based on uh, statistics. And so that is the key part of the system. But before that, I will need to say a couple of words about the company and myself. So again, we are not the most well-known company in this space, uh, at least in the database um, space, because Stardog is actually not marketed as a database company. We are um, more of a data integration, enterprise data integration company. Uh, we are US, US based. Uh, we started in 2006, long time ago, but Stardock as a product started in 2010 when we actually realized the market for the data is pretty big and we didn't have a good product in, in the graph database space uh, to use. So we started our own. The first release, 2011, current version 7.9, um, it's a pretty mature system. It is used in a bunch of big companies, so it's not really a research prototype. It does make us money and uh, used quite a bit. Myself, I do have a fancy title, but what I am is actually an engineer. Uh, I do a lot. Of, um, so I lead the query engine group at Stardog. Been doing it since 2011, straight from my PhD. Um, our group is responsible for everything related to query performance, at least in the core part of the system. So every slow query, which a customer cannot get fixed themselves, they will, that stuff will go to support and in many cases to us. So we get to see a lot of slow queries and you know spend a lot of time trying to figure out what happens, how to improve the query optimizer. Uh, as Andy already said, PhD, my, my PhD was in automated reasoning and uh, in the UK. And before that, I was a software engineer at CERN, the nuclear lab in Europe. So the job itself was a lot less exciting than the environment, but still a time well spent. Um, so what is Stardog? If you if you go into the web page, startup.com, try to figure out what it is, um, that's not going to be extremely simple for you to do. It's the way the system is presented is um, it's, 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 it's a platform for enterprise data integration. So aimed at bigger companies with lots of data sources, lots of databases without a single unified view of the data. So this is where Stardog comes in. But this is not what I'm going to talk about. At the core of the system, it's database um, with some well-defined components. Just to be precise, at the storage level, uh, it's uh, RocksDB. 
database. So that's a key value store uh, forked by Facebook at some point from level DB, a Google, a Google system. Uh, key value store, um, LSM trees uh, based. Um, and Stardog uses it since 7.0. Before that, we had homegrown indices. It's actually pretty amazing how much mileage we got from, from those, from those, we went like six major versions of the product with uh, um, B trees, which we did ourselves um, in, in 2010. So the data model is basically a graph. I will talk a bit more about that, what kind of graph it is. The query language is called Sparkle, W3C standard. It is transactional with full ACE guarantees, um, uh, snapshot isolation implemented via multiverse concurrency control. So it's, um, uh, so writes a chip, uh, reads have to filter out like uncommitted transactions and stuff like that. So um, I will only talk about a single node at this talk. Uh, Stardog does have a cluster, which is the high availability cluster for um, resilience. So every replica has a complete uh, copy of the data. Uh, transactions uh, are strongly consistent. Um, and then it is a bunch of stuff for data integration, data virtualization to help start to sort of achieve that goal of unifying enterprise data again, completely outside of the scope of this work. But it's actually, what is important is that the need to support a bunch of external data sources uh, does affect the design of the query language quite a bit. So even though I'm not gonna talk about it, so this is one reason we love the so-called volcano model, model for query evaluation because it's super extensible, even though it's sort of old, a little bit out of fashion these days, but the extensibility uh, is one reason we're still using it. Um, in terms of programming language, it's hybrid Java C++ systems. So the storage la layer is C++, RocksDB, and a layer uh, directly on top of that to efficiently move data in and out of RocksDB. So that's C++. Uh, the rest of the system is written in Java, including the query language, uh, query engine. Okay, so um, RDF. Like I don't expect any of, uh, many of you to know a lot about RDF. And uh, so what, what RDF is basically a graph data model. If you, if you Google it and go to like W3C spec, you'll, you'll see a bunch of stuff about like the, the web and the IRIs and the blank nodes and, you know, XSD. And it, none of that actually matters a lot for this talk. And also you, you'll find like the, the formal semantics for the language, like what it means for two graphs to be equivalent, for example. So that stuff scares a lot of people, um, but it doesn't matter too much for the usage and it certainly doesn't matter today for us to understand how the queries are optimized. Um, what, so what RDF actually is, it's a bunch of graph edges written as triples uh, with three components, the subject, predicate, and the object. So for example, in the first triple here, you would have John as a subject. He knows, which is a predicate, Mary, which is the object. You can draw it as a graph edge and that's, and that's pretty much it. And, or you can store it as a single large table with three columns, subject, predicate, object. It, it really is as simple as that. So every node can be either an IRI for the web, or it can be um, like a number or a string or a date, any of the XML schema data types. Um, one thing I wanna sort of say explicitly upfront is RDF is really all about relations. It is relational data. It's not stored in tables, but it doesn't make it you know, somehow non-relational. It, it, it really uh, makes me really uncomfortable when people sort of try to um, uh, explain that you have a relational data and then the graph data is somehow not relational. That is usually not helpful. Um, we are dealing with relational structures here, which is not stored in the tables, or we can store it as tables and still expose the, the graph query language uh, uh, interface on top of that. So for example, this triples here, John knows Mary, John likes beer, John has certain age. It's, 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 it's a bunch of facts. Uh, you can write them as relational assertions uh, in, you know, in whatever relational schema you want. 
Um, another thing which people say a lot when they talk about the graphs on ORDF in particular is like RDF data has no schema and, 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 or, uh, and, and that is incredibly con uh, confusing and misleading in, in, in a bunch of ways, especially given that you can Google a little bit further and find that RDF actually has a standard schema language called RDFS, RDF schema. So you can, uh, you can describe things like the domain of a certain relation, like knows is a person. If you know something, you are a person. Or the range of another relation works at is an organization. If you work somewhere, that somewhere is an organization. So what we mean instead, like at least what I am going to mean today, when by no schema is that there's no rigid schema. So there is no need to define relations before adding change the data. So the, the way people generate RDF data is not like a an, in the SQL world, where you first need to define tables and then you fill them up with data. Typically, you just generate some data and then you sort of massage it into some kind of structure. Um, there might be data which just conform to, to the schema. Um, and there might be, and you use the same syntax to describe both the data and the schema. Uh, so there's no separate DDL, so to speak. And the query, the query, the query language semantics, the Sparkle semantics, uh, does not make any use of the schema, does not assume that the data fits the schema in any possible ways. For example, you can have something meaningless in your data, like Bob works at 42. So 42 is clearly not an organization, just a number, but that does not make the query result somehow ill-defined or something. So the, 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 the evaluation semantics uh, will cover that case as well. And what this means for the query language is that you cannot take shortcuts just because the data is somehow messy. You still need to execute the query according to the spec. Um, so a couple words about Sparkle now. So basically what Sparkle is, it's the first order conjunctive queries over RDF. So that's the core of it. Um, on top of that, there's, there's recursion, and there's some other stuff, filters, distinct projections, whatever. But the, the core part is really, it's the first order conjunctive queries over RDF. Um, so for example, if it, this query here, it's from one of the standard benchmarks for, our, uh, for Sparkle. Um, it uh, queries for all the creators of both journal articles and proceedings papers. So the first two um, so-called triple patterns, they, oops, sorry, uh, they, select articles, the second to select uh, proceedings papers, they have the same creator. So the same variable is used for the creator. And then we just we get the name of the creator. You can write it as a, as a data log program uh, and that would have essentially the same semantics. Um, this Sparkle semantics is well-defined via so-called Sparkle algebra in the very SQL-like way. Um, so if you take this query for every query, the spec defines the canonical algebraic expression. So in this case, there would be the basic graph pattern, and then there would be projection of two variables and then distinct filter on top of that. So the, it's, it's, um, it's bottom up. So the or inside out, so the, the, the nested, the deepest nested, uh, uh, sub-expressions are evaluated first. Uh, so the, the rest of the talk, I really will be talking about the BGP part. What's the basic graph patterns? The rest is processed pretty much like in SQL. There are very little differences. Some in the outer joints, but not much. All right, so we'll talk about the basic graph patterns. Um, so let's consider that uh, graph pattern we had previously. We have uh, articles, we have proceeding publications, they need to be created by the same person and we want the name of that person. So how Sparkle specification defines what this actually means. So the job of the spec is to, is to define what the query results should be for every query in every um, instance of the database. So if you like informally, if you represent this query as a graph and the way we do it is basically just writing every variable, so that thing which starts with a question mark as a node, and every triple pattern as an edge. Uh, so like 
So we have one edge for every line here. If you draw that as a graph, and then you essentially compute the mapping of variables to real nodes in the, in the graph. Uh, so the number of all uh, those uh, instanti instantiations will be uh, the results of the query. So for example, here, um, the, this part of the query selects articles with uh, like the type should be article. So that's the, that's the node in the graph. Uh, the article itself is a variable and the creator is a variable. The other part of the query selects the uh, preceding publications. They should have, they should share the same node. That's the join condition. And then uh, we should have a name for that person. So a bit more formally, it's defined as a subgraph homomorphism. Uh, but importantly, the spec does not say anything about how you can compute that homomorphism or, the, or that substitution of variables by values. That's completely up to the query engine. So some people, so some query systems do like traversals. They decide to start at some node in the graph and then traverse the graph in various directions. What Stardog does, it maps every triple pattern to the index scan um, and it joins the results um, and then uh, the the root of the join tree represents the end results to the basic graph pattern what this means for the design of the system is that it's a lot of joints so that's uh, like in, in SQL, I don't know what's considered a lot of joints in SQL world these days, like five tables, 10 tables. Is that like, I, I, no. I have ever heard, I think it was some FAP was uh, 1500. 1500 Wait. joints, or you mean, or joint? Yeah, 1500 tables joined together in a single query. Tables, oh, okay, okay, yeah, that's, that's big. That's big by Sparkle standard as well. I, I, I just asked because I, I sat through some SQL query optimizer talks where they would say things like, if you have more than five tables in the query, we would switch from uh, um, like cost-based optimizer to like heuristic optimizer or stuff like that. Um, Postgres, Postgres switches from the, the cost-based for the, the sort of tree search versus to a genetic algorithm after 13 tables. Okay, okay, yes, that, that kind of stuff. So we have that too, but the thing I'm trying to highlight here is the number of those little triple patterns in the query that can be very big, like hundreds is not too uncommon. They don't necessarily have to be triple patterns. Sometimes they are other algebraic expressions, but the, the number of, of joins, so I'm not talking about the, the size of the search space for the join order yet. It's just the number of the base patterns to join can grow very fast. So that imposes certain restrictions on the design of the, of the query optimizer. So there is very little chance of systematic, um, uh, you know, Ex, ex, um, exploration of the search tree. You need to cut corners. You talked about something. how there was the RDF schema, um, but like you you load RDF data without the schema, right? Yeah. And like, so I guess my question is, what percentage of the, of the startup customers actually come with the schema? Because like the Mongo guys added a schema, but from what I've heard, that nobody actually uses it. Mm. So that's the point I will probably make later which is that most of the graph data sets do have schema. But the problem is that, and, 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 this, and the query optimizer is allowed to use the schema for optimization purposes. Like you can, you can look at the schema information and decide, okay, so this pattern is not gonna match a lot of results. So let's evaluate that first. So that's fine. But what it cannot do, it, it cannot assume that um, just because the range of the predicate is an IRI, there cannot be numbers there. So that part you cannot do. But a lot of what the, our system does and some other graph systems do when they compute statistics, basically they're trying to figure out the schema, whether, the, whether there is exists some, some schema, maybe not explicitly represented and whether the data actually conforms and to what degree. Um, so the join order is critical. Uh, so for example, if we add a little uh, triple pattern here that we are only asking for uh, people who um, work at Stardoc. So our engineers do, do publish papers, but you know, not as many. So that would be a selective pattern to evaluate first. So that would be some somewhere deep in the, in the joint tree. 
Um, so as I said, the join order optimization in Stardog is cost-based optimization problem. Every join order corresponds to some algebraic expression or query plan. There's very little difference uh, uh, in, in, in Stardog between those two concepts. Uh, every query plan has an associated cost. The join order optimizer tries to find the plan with the least cost. And so that's, I believe, is a very standard setup for this problem. In practice, however, it's not just, so the, the search space is not just big because of the space of all possible join orders, even though that itself will give you like a factorial or something. But also you need to pick the join algorithm for every join and there, there could be multiple, like in Stardog, there are merge joins, hash joins, nested loops, usually uh, bind joins, something else. So that blows the search space up a little bit. Um, and there are also constraints on when you you can or cannot use the certain join algorithms. For example, the mirror join algorithm obviously requires the inputs to be sorted on the join key. So that makes the uh, search space bigger, but also uh, imposes some restrictions on it. So here, for example, on the left, we have one join tree with a merge join, um, uh, which uh, computes all the articles and creators, and then it has joined later with people who work at Stardog. So this is a bad plan because, uh, you know, the number of all articles which are going to iterate over is going to be very large in most reasonable database. And after that, you'll get to all the employees of Stardog, which is a small set. Um, and on the right, you have a better plan where you would first get all the, all the nodes, like all the documents created by Stardog employees. So that's going to be a small set. We can sort that in memory. We'll, we'll take milliseconds or even less. And then we can see, essentially do the type check, make sure all of these uh, nodes are articles and output the result. And when I'm talking about like the join, uh, like the, the, no, the join nodes here, so, so, so these are logical plans. These are not executable operators. So all the optimization is done on the logical uh, query plans. So, so this is my experience, like, but I think it generalizes at least in the graph space pretty well, like the reasons of a poor join order. And by the way, there are certainly a way for a query to be slow, even with a perfect join order. So you can get that part right, but still the query is slow because you didn't push the filters or something else. But conversely, if you, if you screw the join order, like there is in most in most cases there is no there is no comeback from that you're done like the query is not going to run fast so that part is absolutely needs to be done sufficiently well and so assuming you have a query which is slow and the join order is bad so the, the reasons for that would be first the search space is big you fail to explore just fail to find the right join order in a very large space second reason your cost model is bad just assign the wrong cost to the plan. You have a plan which appears more expensive, but faster than the one which appears cheaper. And the third reason is the cost model is okay, but the input to the cost model, which is cardinality estimation is bad. And by the way, I, I know that some people present this part a little bit differently. Like they, they might consider statistics a part of the cost model. Um, so the cost model is a, is a function which is, takes the query plan and outputs the number. In, in our setup, the cost model does not depend on the data at all. It, it, it takes, the, it takes the, sum, the statistical summary of the data and the query plan and outputs the number. So if, if, the, if the kernality estimations are bad, and as the result, the cost is, is bad, we don't consider the problem with the cost model, we consider the problem with statistics. So that kind of helps uh, to separate those two things uh, and makes it a bit more manageable. So anyway, so the first reason uh, is kind of in inevitable. So it's a you know NP hard problem after all. So at some your worst case in, in your worst case you will always hit it eventually at some point. But it is rare. So the the search algorithms are pretty good for exploring large search spaces. The second problem the 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 bug in the cost model which is not related to statistics is usually an easy fix like easy uh, because you know. Nothing is 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 
easy in in the database uh, world, but usually does not may, uh, take too much effort to fix it. And 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 also as your system matures, it happens less and less often. Like I I remember at some point it was happening uh, um, quite often, but then we have regression test for all the cases where the uh, the cost model gets it wrong, and now it doesn't happen a lot. But the cardinality misestimations, when they are wrong, and the cost model basically waves hands and says, okay, that's that's the best cost estimation I can give you, given what you tell me about your data. So that is unfortunately where I spend most of my time on, and that's what keeps me up at night, uh, because it's a major research problem. And also what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the talk. So, okay, so, so here's the basic problem. We have a graph pattern, we're trying, maybe we're trying to find the, the, the best joint tree or something else. The basic question is how many results that graph pattern is gonna match when you run it, when we evaluate it on our data. Um, so there are, so you need to answer that question somehow to tell the optimizer, you know, how to optimize your query, but there are some obvious constraints, like you cannot, just run that pattern against the data and, and output the perfect estimation because um, in, in the worst case, there might be a non-polynomial number of cardinality estimations during the joint planning phase. So each estimation must be like really, really, really fast. Uh, and uh, some of them repeat, so you need to cache them um, and so on. So it's clear that you need to pre-compute something. Right. Can I just ask for clarification, please? Sure. When you say cardinality estimate, are you including things like whether different attributes are correlated and, and um, things like that? So it's not just the cardinality of the raw data, it's cardinality of any intermediate result as well? Yeah, so, for, uh, so when I say the cardinality estimate, I, I mean that we need to know how many results a certain pattern produces, but that pattern can be joined to other patterns like A and B. And then of course we need to know the correlation of A and B, like how often they occur together. Otherwise, okay, if, if the database system doesn't have anything in statistics about correlation and just assumes independence all the time, then it's, at least in, in Sparkle space, there's not much you can do. Um, right, thank you. Right, so, okay. So it's clear that we need to pre-compute something. Uh, but you don't know the schema and uh, maybe in some cases there is no explicit schema and you, you need to figure it out from the data. The query workload may not be known in advance uh, and the data can be large, like billions of edges, like 10, 15, 50 billion edges. That's what I usually, we usually mean large for a single node. Like we're talking about single node here a and it can change. So when Star Stardog started, Nobody cared anything about, like nobody cared too much about the velocity, how, how quickly the data changes. So Stardock was mo motivated by the system called um, RDF3X, that's Thomas Neumann uh, RDF implementation. And that was like in 2011, the, the world was, okay, you load a bunch of graph data, you, you index everything, and then you run a bunch of complex queries and the data doesn't change. If it needs to change, just wipe and load the new data and do it again. Under those conditions, your life is a lot easier because you, there's a lot of you can pre-compute. These days, and this is, which is one reason we changed the backend at some point, this is no longer the world. The data does change and statistics needs to adapt. Um, okay, so what we actually pre-compute and, and, and how we use it, that's, that's what, what's gonna come next. So one very common pattern, which, which, is, which occurs in pretty much every Sparkle query is the so-called star-shaped subgraphs. So when you have a node in the middle and a bunch of outgoing edges, like you're querying all the information about like an article, uh, its type, its creator, its year when it was published, uh, the proceedings volumes, stuff like that. So the, the query shapes like that are super common. Why are they common? The reason they are common is because that's how people tend to model business objects, like a node with a bunch of attributes. And also because these structures are essentially direct re reflections of tables. So you can model this data as a single table for publication with a bunch of columns. Every column 
corresponding to the outgoing edge. Like the publication would, would be a table with four columns. And a lot of the graph data was a tabular data at some point. And then for whatever reason, people decided to move it to the graph. Um, so how do we compute that? Those, those uh, subject um, shaped graphs or SSGs. SSG. SSGs. We can do it in just one pass over the index, which we have, where every edge is sorted by the subject node. So it's one of the indexes which Stardo has. If you, if you, if you do a single pass over that index, you can uh, compute all those um, uh, SSGs. And the interesting, like the really interesting thing here, which again was discovered by Neumann, uh, and validated multiple times in my experience as well, is that the number of distinct uh, uh, star-shaped patterns is extremely low, even, than the, even when the data is extremely large. Like you can have a graph data set of billions of ages and, and, and have like 50 or 100, maybe 150 different um, patterns like that, where the differences in terms of the predicates, uh, like predicate labels. And, 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 it's act, and it's very interesting to think like why that is the case. Like if, because if, if, if that is not the case, you can always find the, the situation when, when it's not the case, then a lot of things like start falling apart, you need to do something else. But that is the case because most data sets, they do have some schema, even though the data may not always conform, but essentially what, what is happening here is you're trying to figure out those tables which were you know, originally created for, for that data when the data was first modeled and then moved to the graph. And a lot of the graph data sets were, as I said, tables at some point. And uh, the truth is, is that in real life, most schemas are compact, even when data is large. Um, so since that um, patterns, SSGs, they can be maintained in, uh, in memory, there are very efficient data structures like tries, essentially prefix trees. So we can query that during coronal estimations, very efficient. And that, that idea again goes back to Thomas Neumann uh, characteristic set paper for RDF. Like I might named Thomas many times during this talk, by the way, like my relationship to his work is, is really complicated. Like it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm both like, um, fascinated and a little bit annoyed because every, I'm fascinated because we managed to take advantage of a lot of his stuff, but annoyed because when you think of something smart, either you find it in some Thomas paper or it doesn't work. Or, 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 it doesn't happen always, but that's sometimes the impression I, I get. Thomas is, in my opinion, one of the, the, he's probably the world's greatest database researcher right now. He's the, it, most German yeah. all, the most German of all the Germans. He's amazing. It's an intimidating a little bit, I find it, but also like, yeah, anyway, but you, also there's a lot the of crazy, stuff, there's a lot of the stuff here. He, yeah, he, he writes a lot of code, he writes a lot of papers, yeah. and he's got three kids. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I know, but a lot of things he, he does also, I just, we couldn't really implement easily, like cold gen stuff, for example, in, in Hyper is crazy. But anyway, I, I, I digress. So, if we look at our query, we'll see that, okay, we have those uh, subjects uh, shaped graphs, but there is a complication here. The one of the attributes is not a variable, but is actually uh, a concrete value, like the so-called bound object. So we're not just asking for um, all things which uh, you know have some type, have some creator, but they need to have the type article. So uh, we need to account for that in cardinality estimation. Um, so we know the number of, you know, the subgraphs of this shape in our data set, but we don't know anything about article, uh, but, but how many of them are articles. So the, what Neumann says is basically use selectivity of this constant, given the label of the predicate and assume independence with, uh, with creator. So that's the kind of standard assumption in uh, cardinality estimation error. Like if you don't know anything about correla correlation, assume independence. And that works pretty well 
but this is one area where we can do better. I sincerely believe we can do better than the cardinality, uh, than the characteristic sets paper written by Neumann, and I'm genuinely proud of that. So this is where the count mean sketches enter the picture. And uh, like, I, I don't know if, if I need to talk a lot about what those are. Like, I feel you must have talked about this stuff before me. So I will be very brief here. They are like, if you know how bloom filters work, they are similar in, 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 in a certain way. Like bloom fil filters are probabilistic sets and, you know, count mean sketches are probabilistic multi sets. They give you the approximate frequency for, uh, ob for an object in a data stream. Um, so if, so the bloom filters, they are sort of one dimensional, the count mean sketches, they are two dimensional, you have multiple hash functions. So when you consume the stream, you have, you apply the hash function, like four different hash functions in this example, uh, you increment like four counters for every object in your, in, in your stream and then when you query when you when you want to know how many times a certain object occurred in the stream you just take the minimum over all these four rows so the the the, the uh, fascinating thing here is that it's like it's an extremely compact data structure it's more compact than bloom filter in like bloom filters are linear and this one this one is sublinear like i can i can talk later like why that is the case but if you have like uh, so most count means sketches in stardog they are four hash functions and the, the row is like uh, 1,024, like 1K long, like 1,064-bit uh, uh, integers, which means the total footprint, the memory footprint is like 32K. And I told you before that the number of uh, those patterns which we pre-compute is small. So you have like 50 of those, maybe 100 times, 32k that's pretty much nothing you can keep all that in memory for your estimations and that image credit to Adrian Coyla. Um, so the, the caveats uh, the count mean sketches they overestimate they never underestimate and they are great for detecting the so-called heavy hitters the objects which occur many 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 times in your data sets but what they cannot do for you they cannot distinguish between objects which occur rarely versus the objects which do not occur at all. Um, but that is fine. <laughs> we can live with that. The reason we can live with that is when we're trying to estimate the cardinality of a pattern and, 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 and we cannot distinguish between the pattern like not matching anything in the data and matching 10 up to 1,000 results, we don't care because in any case, that's going to be a very quick, fast, pattern to uh, evaluate and, and you can uh, do whatever you want with its results like sort in memory it it will be fast so the the weakness of the count mean sketch by and large doesn't matter um, so what happens is we augment every uh, subject star pattern which we pre-compute with a sketch so that's the improvement over the characteristic set approach um, the interesting part here is we like the the those bound objects they can occur at the end of any predicate, but we only compute one sketch per this star shaped pattern. Why that works? Like that is maybe not obvious, but the reason this work it works is because in real life most property ranges are disjoint. Like if you have a business object with a bunch of attributes, yes, you can always imagine the case where you have like you know attributes with overlapping uh, ranges but in most cases uh they are more or less disjoint so we can get away with only one sketch per um, ssg um then okay, okay we're not done yet we we can estimate this the the star shape but then there is a join on the object variable like we're trying to find the uh, articles and proceedings papers written by the same Person. So there is a join here, and we need to know how many results that matches. Of course, we can do the same thing again. We can pre-compute uh, uh, star-shaped patterns, but not for outgoing edges, but for incoming edges. But that 
and, and I and I thought about that a number of times, but that seems like an overkill because you spend uh, just as much time doing that, but they are substantially less common. So what we do instead, we use the average uh, in degree for the creator um, predicate, and that seems to work reasonably well. And that's also uh, takes less time to compute. But then the most problematic part is the so-called frequent chain estimations. And now, and now it's, it, it, it becomes a little bit similar to like all those various data mining approaches, like you know, mining frequent patterns, that kind of stuff. Uh, so the problem here is um, to estimate how many of those publication creators actually have a name. Um, we need to know how frequently this chain occurs in the data creator and then name that pair of predicates. And then at this time, we have to assume independence between the uh, estimation of the of those star shaped subgraphs and the chain estimations. Uh, but so um, the question is how many create slash name chains are in the data and um, it's essentially means that we're trying to figure out the foreign key relationships in the graph data like in the relational in in the in the SQL world that would be the foreign key relationship relationship but without that being explicit in the schema we have to figure it out from the data um, and in this case you uh, you can see that the name is usually functional uh, functional relation in most reasonable data sets so that so the statistics will figure that out and we will uh, use that for estimation that every person has a single name um, so just as with the star shape patterns the there are lo lots of um, graph chains um, the binary chains in the data but not so many frequent ones uh, so the interesting thing is you need to figure out from the data you need to analyze a lot of data but the result of your computation is usually compact so that is true across all the statistics computation that we do um, and we can pre-compute all frequent chains in the graph data via essentially one join um, over the full database and we're trying to improve that by looking into sampling so that it it, it takes so it would take a sublinear time uh, rather than linear time. Um, and then we discard the low frequency chains. Uh, and again, when we have to deal with the objects being bound to constants on the on the right uh, hand side of the chain, like for patterns, like give me all articles uh, written by Paul Erdos. So now we have a constant on, on, on the right end. We do the same trick, we use the count mean sketch for all the chains which we like all the frequent chains which we discovered in the data so now putting all this estimation to, together how it actually works algorithmically when we have a queer pattern like this so the first thing we do is we actually trans so this on the left hand side that's your query as you would reason about it as a human because that's how the it, it, it resembles the data. On the right hand side is what the query um, optimizer actually uses. It's so called join graph. In the join graph, every node is a triple pattern and they are connected by an edge if, they, if there is a join condition between them. So, for example, the join condition in Sparkle here would be the shared variable. Um, and then the rest of the cardinality estimation. Uh, logic is basically covering the join graph with those statistical summaries which we pre-computed before so for example we look at this we see okay article it's the subject uh it's a subject in both patterns which means it's a star shaped pattern let's use the uh, ssg statistics for that look there is another uh star shaped pattern we also must have the uh statistics for that so that part is covered then there is a join edge between those two which is the join on the object variable we don't have the star shaped statistic uh, uh, there but it's 
it's on we know something about this uh, predicate uh, namely the average in degree so we're going to use that and then finally there is uh, only one node left and it's a chain join uh, because the object because uh, the shared variable creator is the in, in the object position on the left and the subject position on the right hand side so we're going to use the chain statistics for that so what you get in the end is essentially um, the minimal spanning tree so a cover like you cover your query, like the join graph with available statistics uh, for your data uh, in some deterministic way until you get the minimal spanning tree. And then you compute uh, the uh, overall cardinal estimation for your pattern. Basically, just you multiply the cardinal estimation for every node times the selectivity of each join edge here. And you arrive at a single number for a pattern. So that. Um, I think I am mostly I'm done for the most of the content, uh, but I I, I want to talk about stuff which doesn't work all that well, uh, not just about stuff which works great, which is like count min sketches. I, I love those. I can I can spend like a whole hour just on them, but I also want to talk about things which don't work that nicely. So the the biggest problem in, in all this space is that you get the pretty accurate kernel estimations at the lower level of the query plan. But when you join uh, like individual triple patterns, like for example here, we would have a nearly perfect estimation of the number of, of the number of articles and creators in the database, and the same for the preceding papers. But we will have less accurate estimation on the next level when we join on creator and then possibly even less accurate on the level after that when we uh, oh, when we get the names. Well, this is going to be accurate because it's a functional predicate, but in general, the, the more you go up the query plan, the, the more um, estimation errors accumulate. And uh, since the query plan can be deep, when, with, um, it can be both bushy and deep, and uh, so the errors might accumulate. So what looks like a reasonable estimation at the lower level might look might be a couple of orders of magnitude off at, at the root of the plan. Um, so that is the biggest issue here. And it's difficult for the query engine to know at which point it can no longer trust the kernel estimations. Um, so in addition to the basic kernel estimation framework, which most systems seem to have these days, um, the, the query engine needs uh, things like safety nets, for example. It's like what happens if you, you, when you thought your hash table is going to contain 1,000 results, you start computing the hash table for the hash join, and turns out it's a couple million results, and you don't have memory for that. Like you cannot just crash the system. So what Stardog does, it spills data, it starts spilling data to disk, uh, which which means the query gets lower, but the server remains operational. You can terminate the query, you can hit the timeout, and you can you know you can uh, operational operationalize around that. Um, another thing which is useful is the feedback loop. The, Sorry, it, what, is, what is the open problem? You spilled a dip. There's, I mean, there's nothing you can really do. Yeah, but um, um, no, but the open problem is how to detect that the kernel estimate. Like, how do you figure out the the bounds for your misestimation? Like, how wrong it can really be? Because if you if you because Depending on the place in the query plan, it may or may not matter too much. For, for example, if your estimation, let's say, is 10, and you it, it can be two orders of magnitude wrong, that means your boundaries of from zero to what thousand. So that that's not going to matter because you know, as I said, computing the hash table of 10 results versus computing hash table of thousand results, no practical difference. If your base estimation is million and you still can be two orders of magnitude off, that's a substantially more risky situation. Uh, and uh, there's not much reasoning happening around 
that. Like there are join algorithms which you would not use, for example, if the risk of kernel estimation is particularly large. Like my favorite example is the bind join, which, which can be absolutely amazing in some cases and horribly disastrous in some other cases. Like that's that's the join algorithm I would not use if even if the th things look okay, but I know that the kernel estimation could be very wrong here. So that's so that's I understand. Yeah, that's good, thank you. Okay. But then okay, so spilling to disk is, is good, but then um the problem there is um, it's difficult to account for things like the amount of available memory in your cost model. Like you don't know which other queries are running in the system. You don't know if you're going to have enough memory for this hash table. You don't know if that hash join is, is going to spill or not. The, feed, the feedback loop. So that, that's a that's a great thing. Like in, in, in some cases, the query engine can detect that it made a mistake in the past. Like it starts computing the hash table thinking it was, it was going to be hundred uh, elements in the end it was million it can actually use that uh, information for future queries um, unfortunately it's not, it's not going to help you to save the current query but maybe you will not make that mistake in, in the future but what's really interesting and where like we don't do enough and we should do more is like sometimes the query engine really needs the plan b when it when it sees that the query execution went horribly wrong, like uh, you start computing hash table and you see that you're not going to have enough memory and this, the estimation was bad. Can you, like what some systems do, they can swap the order of um, operands of the hash join. That makes, that creates some other troubles because it might um, impact the order in which the results are coming out of the hash join. And that in turn impacts the further, you know, join uh joins up up the tree um so i think a better approach which we're looking at is instead of re-optimizing while executing like swapping operand it might be uh, i th i personally think it's more interesting to look into um incremental executing the query while you're still optimizing like uh your your kernel estimation is risky at some point you see that maybe you can afford spending a little bit more time to you know executing that little part of the query and use that information to uh, optimize later or maybe just rely less on on, on kernel estimations and, and i know it sounds weird because i just spent like a whole hour telling you how the kernel estimations are important but this is this query which this question bothers me a lot like maybe we are relying too much on kernel estimations maybe maybe just at some level of the query plan you just need to switch to something else the problem is you don't know when you don't know when your kernel estimates uh start being too imprecise for the for the task and then we, finally we previous talks from databricks and snowflake mm -hmm. to tackle this exact problem but like how okay. much how much query planning can you do without cardinality estimates and then make oh that's interesting apply. yeah that's, yeah, I, I I saw some papers on like trying to figure out the bounds and uh, what you do later. Like uh, I, so far, we haven't been able to put any of that into the working system, like in, in production. But Alan, uh, but, but can I can I uh, just point to sure. one interesting direction which has sort of started being explored is robustness of yeah. the optimization so rather than trying to find the best you try to find a plan which is not so sensitive to yes. mistakes yes absolutely that's a this is a great point uh, and and that's one of the issues in stardog is uh the when it gets things right the queries are very fast but uh if, if it gets things wrong then there's no you cannot really say how bad it's going to be it can be arbitrarily bad and um uh so yes, robustness. Um, so just wrapping up, I was only talking about the, um, the the very basic part of Sparkle, which is the basic graph patterns. There is a lot more stuff which makes cardinality estimations difficult. So for example, recursive patterns. You have things like transitive properties. How many people you know, uh, if, if you know someone, if you know John and John knows Mary, you know Mary. So the, the reachability kind of estimations, that's a huge issue. Um, estimations for query patterns which go out to some other system, 
like in your in the data virtualization um, use case, that's a whole next level of complexity because that system now needs to tell you something about the data which resides there, and there is no common API or interface how you can you know query for cardinality estimations for in a separate system. Most most systems do not expose that over any kind of standard query language. Um, I haven't talked much about the uh, computational issues for statistics, like how often we do that. And uh, so the standard uh, setup is do that when the more than 10% of the data changes. Um, I haven't talked about things like sampling, uh, which I fully believe we need to do more to make, uh, to make the cardinality estimation a little bit faster. So the, there is a bit of a problem in the graph space uh, when it comes to sampling, like sampling from the graph in such a way that the sample has the same structural properties as the original graph. So that is not straightforward at all. Like, for example, you can read the same frequent chains from the sample as from the original graph. That That's difficult. So we are looking into both sampling and summarizations. The, the graph, like it's compression, for example, instead of sampling. Uh, incremental computation and and then uh, yeah a bunch of other things I don't have time to talk about which we do like debugging the query performance problems like when you when the query is slow you want to know which join is actually bad like which join computes more intermediate results um, than was predicted by cardinal estimation we can do that with the query profiler which collects that information uh, and that's hugely useful and then performance testing, the cost model testing, and um, there is a framework for that. And then I will just throw this stuff in the very end. So maybe uh, uh, maybe we don't even need to do all this fancy statistics collection stuff. All we need to do is to train uh, a machine learning model, which will figure out the data properties and just tell us the accurate cardinality estimations for the for the job. Like there are a bunch of papers on that topic, which like, every year I see at least several in this space. I have a backlog for maybe at least 10 or 15 papers. Um, and every year I'm, I'm making this new year resolution to you know look into that and, and maybe that will simplify everything and just win decisively and it just never happens. Um, anyway, so that, uh, that concludes the presentation. Uh, thanks a lot for the attention. Like we are hiring. Uh, if you have any questions uh, later, you can always contact me. I'll happy to chat about any of these things, about things which work and even more so about things which do not work. So thanks a lot. I will, I will clap my half hour now. Pavel, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. All right, we have time for one question from the audience. If anyone wants to fire away. Uh, Hamid said in chat he's got one. Oh, Hamid, go for it. Okay, so the question I have is. Oh, we lost him. You muted yourself. Yeah, I think. Ask him to unmute. Okay, got it. <laughs> Okay. So the question that I have is that what size databases are we really dealing with? Is it like a terabyte or hundred terabyte or petabyte? And in that context, how do you compare yourself with the Cambridge semantics? Oh, I will probably not be the best person to ask about the comparison with Cambridge semantics, like Anza people. Like, uh, <laughs> um, so. So we have other people in the call. So maybe Evren, you know yeah. something about how we compare to Anza. Yeah, I mean, to answer the size question, we are mostly talking about terabytes of data, not petabytes. Uh, that was the first part, I think. In comparison to Cambridge semantics, I mean, there's a lot of overlap with respect to RDF and Sparkle. Uh, but one thing they have is like an in-memory parallel query engine, which is quite different than what we are doing with like RocksDB based, uh, disk based indexes. Like we don't use as much memory as they do, then there are different challenges and so on. And if you look at like, as Pavel mentioned at the very beginning, 
if you look at the problem space of data integration, there are lots of differences at that level as well. But the main difference for the graph database or what we Pavel talked about today, it's mostly like in memory versus not in memory. Mm -hmm. I think it's, my last question is like, I don't know anything about, you know, graph optimizers as well. I mean, you told me a bunch of stuff, but I, I don't know what like, like Neo4j or, or like um, Tiger Graph. Like in my understanding, like Neo4j is a cost-based optimizer. Is there anything about that they do that you don't do that, that, that you, you want to add or for you guys that are approaching the same problem in, in similar ways? Um, so the query language which Neo has, like I'm not, I'm not so much familiar with the Tiger Graph query language that uh, GKL, uh, but the Neo4j query language and a lot of things which they do are similar. Like Cypher has similar semantics to Sparkle. It's it's a bit different. Uh, it's it's graph isomorphism, not homomorphism, uh, but it is declarative. And uh, when I talk to their engineers, I get the impression that um, they do a lot of similar stuff. Like I, I never really felt like we need to do something. Maybe they didn't disclose enough. In talking with me, uh, that we need to borrow something from. Uh, from Neo4j, uh, but I, I I suspect they do more on the uh, parallel query execution for like large all up style queries than we do because I know that's one of the places where we can do a better job than we do currently, okay. but certainly okay. not in the in the kernel estimations area. Okay. <laughs>